to Colossians, which comes out, no doubt, in the section we'll be reading today. As you look at the Colossian heresy, it had sort of bred out from a few different backgrounds. One of them was just Greco-Roman paganism. One of them was a Jewish worship of angels, which is something that had developed in some parts of the world at the time. That's not Old Testament. That's not what they were supposed to do. This is what they did. They worshipped angels, some of them. Uh, there's also um, some part of, of what we can call, what ended up being called Gnosticism. And basically their theology was this, that there was one supreme, divine, amazing, perfect, righteous, holy God, but he was pure spirit, and he would never do the unthinkable, which is create a physical world. Physical is evil. Matter, anything that can be seen, touched, tasted, handled, smelt, that's evil. And so God didn't do that. What, the, what the, the, the Godhead did was he just created another being that was like God, but not quite as perfect. And then their theology says that that slightly less perfect God made another God slightly removed from him. And so it went on in these thousands of generations of gods until you have a God that was powerful enough to create, but removed enough from the holy being that he was evil enough to create. And that God is the God that created the physical world. Therefore, they have a couple of elements of their theology. First of all, it's okay to worship any of the intermediary beings, what they call the pleroma of the gods, or the angels, the, the, the semi-demi-gods that were up there. They would worship those because there's lots of them. You basically can't get it wrong. Pick one, worship it, think one up and worship it. It probably exists up there. But the second thing that went hand-in-hand hand with that, which was very practical was the reality that they thought of the physical world as evil, the spiritual realm as righteous. Therefore, as many spiritual experiences as you could have, you were more holy. And the more you were involved in the physical world, you were less holy. It also meant that their eschatology, their salvation meant that one day God would finally release us from this body, release us from this world, and we'll go back into the spiritual plane of existence. It's more like Buddhism than Christianity. So often Paul would argue for the reality that we will be resurrected into a human body, into a physical world at the end of the world, just as Jesus was resurrected. That was so important to fighting these heresies in the early church. So as we look into uh, 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 the, the book of Colossians, we see one main theme explode through the pages, which Epaphras maybe just wasn't honed in enough to, to realize that this very simple doctrine was the answer to all of the problems. And it at the same time, fights the Jewish worship of angels. It fights the, the fake holiness of spirituality. It, it also fights the paganism and it fights uh, the Gnosticism. And that single doctrine that just explodes through every line in Colossians is the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. The absolute, unlimited ultimate sufficiency of Jesus Christ. Now, I say the word sufficiency and maybe, maybe you're a bit disappointed because you were hoping for a good, real positive, powerful word. And, uh, and sufficient just sounds a, a little bit almost insulting. We can imagine if a husband and a wife were doing their vows on a wedding day and here I am, or here Pastor Wayne is, and, uh, 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 officiating the wedding and it comes to the gentleman's uh, vows and he looks at his bride and she's beautiful. Hair is done, wonderful dress. She is, she is uh, uh, dressed to the tee and he says to her, babe, you'll do. And steps on down. <laughs> How do you think that marriage is going to go? <laughs> if he says, you'll do, you are, you're enough, you're sufficient. Doesn't sound overly romantic, does it? You don't want that on a Valentine's card. It doesn't sound over the top. We usually want our language to be flowery and overflowing. And yet, the sufficiency of Christ, is, it, we're not trying to come up with a flattering or, or a flowery word. We're simply saying an absolute truth that for everything God wants to give you, for everything God demands of you, Christ is sufficient. And Christ alone is sufficient. And once we get our minds around that properly, 
every other temptation to fake holiness, to false worship, and to other pagan uh, uh, patterns simply falls off of our palate. We don't want it anymore. We don't even have to be told not to do it because we can't even imagine ourselves doing it because we are so enamored with Christ who simply is enough. He hasn't, he hasn't left anything out that we would want to go and have. Didn't we just sing that uh, 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 in Jesus Christ, heaven now has no more to give? When people want more than Jesus, they're asking for something that literally doesn't exist. God can't give you more than Jesus through faith. He has nothing more to give you than Jesus. And that's not a statement of him being poor. That's a statement of him being infinitely generous. If you want more, you don't need to get more. You need to realize you have that more in Jesus. So as all of that came to a head, there was Old Testament laws that the Jews tried to sneak in on top of the Colossians. And and what it really ended up doing was, and this is a truism in the church, your doctrine of sanctification... How you grow in holiness is always downstream from your doctrine of salvation in Christ. If you have a deficient doctrine of salvation in Christ, that's the only time that your doctrine of sanctification starts going awry. We'll see that today. But in Colossae, the false teachers had had, had sort of started breeding in the church avenues of false ways of being holy. And we're going to read that now in chapter 2, verse 16, until the end of the chapter in verse 23. Hear now the words of the one true living God. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or in regards to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of These are a shadow of the things that to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels and going on in details about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. Verse 20. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed, he's admitting something here, they do indeed have an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. May God bless the reading of his own inerrant and powerful word in our midst this morning. Amen. Amen. Look at verse 16. We have, beginning out today, the command of Paul, the demand of Paul that Christians would step up and stand up for themselves and fight for their right. Not, if you lived through the 80s, not fight for their right to party. Fight for their right to live in the freedom that Jesus purchased. Often, Christians are told, maybe you heard this, I know Pastor Wayne did, I was there on the Zoom call. Maybe you've heard this, that as you stand up for the rights and freedoms of yourself and others, you're told you're being selfish. Jesus gave up his rights. Christians aren't allowed to defend their rights. That's not always true. In fact, as that said, that's not true. Christians are those, should be those, who know their rights and stand up for their God-given rights because my rights are my neighbor's rights. I'm standing up for my neighbors and my children, my grandchildren. But in this context, in the church... Paul is not saying, hey, Colossians, I know you want to do things, and I know your sensibilities and your preferences are being offended, and you're not allowed to wear the clothes or drink the drinks or eat the foods or go to the places that you want, and I care about your wants, so I'm going to tell you to fight for your own rights. See, that's not his concern. The concern is not ultimately that they're not able to do what they want. The concern is that there are people creeping into the church and taking away a freedom that is blood bought at Calvary. 
It's your choice whether you walk in all of the freedom that Jesus gave you or not. What you eat, drink, smoke, wear, go, whatever. That's your freedom, but it is no one else's permission to, to what he says here in verse 16, pass judgment on you. He says they are, and this is the definition of tyranny, they are taking to themselves an authority not given to them. They're not Lord of the church. They didn't bleed for your soul. They didn't die for you. They didn't purchase you. They are not head of the church. Only Jesus is. And by his blood, he has purchased your soul, but he has purchased your soul to a freedom that sets you free. And therefore, he says, do not let anyone pass judgment on you. Don't let them. They try and, they try and uh, enforce a, uh, an authority that they think they have. You stand up to them and say, not because you care about your rights, but because you know that the gospel has certain implications that you're, you're demanded as a Christian to stand up for and defend. You don't have a right to say that. Even if what you're saying is helpful, possibly, you don't have a right to pretend it's an authority on other Christians' lives. So he says, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of, and this is where the Old Testament Jewish laws started being hand-picked by the legalists and added in, in terms of food and drink, or in regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. What he's saying here in, the, in this sense, Paul is saying, he's coming back to the context of the main message, Christ is sufficient. You don't need additional laws or Old Testament shadows to, to complement him. He does fine just on his own. <clears throat> and so what he's going to say here is that he is the substance. He is the reality that all the Old Testament was pointing to. It's backwards. It's folly. It's harmful to resurrect the shadow and cast it on top of Jesus. That would be to, that would be to hide the face of Jesus Christ. He's now the substance. So, so he's mentioning here the food, drink, festival, new moon, and Sabbath. They're all just leftovers from the Jewish laws that were being recycled by the legalists into the Colossian church. <clears throat> and it is true, we won't, we won't forget that in other parts of Scripture, like Romans 14... Paul does talk about things like what you're eating and what you're drinking and what days you worship on and what additional uh, day, holy days, in the proper sense of the word, that you set apart for yourself in the Christian life. It, it is true that in Romans 14, he says that, that that's up to the individuals. And sometimes, for the sake of not tempting other people into sin, you might choose to lovingly abstain from those things or abstain from other freedoms that you have so that you're not, you're not causing people to sin. That's true, but the Colossian situation is different. The question in Romans was, what am I allowed to do? Where might my love take me in behavior? The question in Colossians is, who has the right to tell me what I'm allowed to do? And on that, Paul is saying, only Christ. Don't listen to people. Stand up against them and when they try and intimidate them. Throw the, their assessments of you in the fire. Do you know the story of Martin Luther and the papal bull? Martin Luther, when he was uh, starting out his, the activity that would become really the, the Reformation, and he was writing, and he was preaching, and he was teaching against the, uh, the errors of the, of the Catholic Church and the, 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 the false authority of the Pope, and he received what was called a papal bull. And it was a document that said, you have, this is a, a divine, authoritative document. You are demanded to throw your books in the fire, recant of your teachings, and admit that you are wrong in public. And so he, in seeming obedience, he gathered his friends and his students and his church into, the, into the, the street and they lit a fire. And he said, pardon me, I'll bring what needs to be burned. And he walked off. He came back with the papal bull. And in public, he threw it into the fire and basically said, Lord, help me. <laughs> Come what may. That's what you need to do. Somebody comes up to you and says, oh, you're wearing, you're wearing that color or you're wearing pants 
oh, ladies shouldn't wear pants. Or, or they come and say, oh, you, you, you stepped into a bar. I thought you were a Christian. Or, or you, you, you ate this food or that food. Don't you realize, you know, I can show in Leviticus that in fact, whenever they do that, you take their assessment of you and they say, you're a, you're a false, you're a half Christian. You're not as a holy Christian. You tear it up in your mind. You throw it into the fire and you walk off free of their assessments and judgments. They don't have the authority to do that to you. In 1 Timothy 4, this is, this is in fact so important that in 1 Timothy 4, Paul calls, when, when, when he tells Timothy that there are some people in the church, false teachers, who are going to tell people to not get married and to not eat certain foods, which, which sounds like the Catholic church, don't get married, don't eat red meat on Fridays, etc., etc. When they make as a matter of law, or holiness, not getting married and not eating certain foods. He says that they are demonic teachings that liars who have seared their conscience are putting forward into the church. And one question has to come up. We go, really? I mean, is my salvation, is this church the, the, the buttress of truth and the pillar of, 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 of righteousness in the world, you know, that Jesus is a... St- is it so fickle, so weak, so, so, so up in the air that simple things like food and clothing and drink can, can, can topple it? The answer is no, it's not. The problem is not that your salvation is on the line. The problem is that Christ has purchased a freedom of which no one else is allowed to impose. The new covenant is far too important to allow false teachers to come in and tell the precious bride of Christ what she's allowed to do when Christ has not told them those things. That's what's important enough. Because, yeah, in Romans 14, Paul says, the, the kingdom is not a matter of, li- of what you eat and drink. That's true. However, the kingdom is a matter of blood-purchased freedom. And so if people take that away by imposing what you're allowed to wear, eat, or drink, then you have a very serious problem. And that's Paul's point. So here in in verse 17, he, he says that these leftover Jewish laws, these are just the shadow of the things to come. Or in more honest translation, it would be, these are the shadow of what used to be to come, but now is come. It now already is here. They used to be pointing forward, but not forward into our future, forward into our past. Forward to Jesus Christ, so that when he came, their point is is now extinguished. It's complete. It's fulfilled. They can pass away. The substance of the Old Testament law is now finalized in Jesus Christ because he, as Paul says here, is the substance. The Old Testament worship system was simply and only ever meant to be a temporary way of worshiping God, a momentary way of worshiping God, and preparatory. It had an inbuilt insufficiency. It's as if... if If an Old Testament Jew came up to God and said, I'm reading this covenant, it actually can't give me eternal life. I'm reading, you know, the the, the covenantal uh, dogma and requirements and commandments, and actually, God, it tells me here, I don't see anywhere here that, that any of these lambs are able to cleanse my conscience from sin. And God would say, yeah, this isn't the final product. It's got an intentionally, divinely, inbuilt insufficiency in the Old Covenant. Now, that doesn't mean it was wrong or erroneous. I'm not a critical scholar. I'm not saying that that the Old Testament was wrong. It was just purposeful. It was only given until Christ came, and then he would abolish it. And so we see in Hebrews 10, Hebrews 10 verse 1, it says, Since the law has but a shadow, same word again, shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities. Shadow versus form. Shadow versus a structure. It doesn't have the true form of these realities. So it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. The old, you want to know how, how the, the absolute evidence that the Old Testament was not sufficient? You had to do the sacrifices over and over and over and over and over. That's how you know a sacrifice is, is not sufficient. If you go to a friend and she tells you with a $100 bottle of lavender oil 
and she tells you, you know, you take this, you'll never have hay fever again. Once in a lifetime dosage. And you, you buy it and you take it. And next week you come back, I've got hay fever again. And she goes, that's great. Just take another once in a lifetime dosage of the lavender oil. And you go, what, am I taking it wrong? It doesn't once in a lifetime mean not repeated? And that's the case with the atonements. If the atonements are needed over and over again, it didn't cleanse your conscience. It didn't save you. So in other words, I'm saying some people will think that if you say that the Old Testament was insufficient, then you're saying it was sinful or wrong or God made mistakes. No. In fact, it's the opposite. If you say that the new covenant needs help from the old covenant, you're saying God made a mistake. The new covenant's substance is Christ. It needs no help, no accessories, no headdress, no makeup from the Old Testament law, which was simply a blueprint pop-up book. The Old Testament saints lived in a pop-up book, but it was just a blueprint pop-up book. Jesus is the actual structure and form. You don't now need to cut up the Old Testament and glue it on top of Jesus so that it looks better. It was simply a shadow. Hebrews 8 verse 13 says that that since God has has, has, um, uh, spoken of a new covenant coming, and since he has established a new covenant, it makes the old one obsolete. And if obsolete, then it is ready to pass away. Jesus Christ is far too powerful, sufficient, glorious to need the help of additional Old Testament laws. He is the true Christ. He is the true king. He is the true priest. He is the true sacrifice and the true temple. And if we read verse 11 of chapter 2 in Colossians, just up a few verses, Paul says, In him you also were circumcised, with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you also raised with him through faith. So, so Jesus Christ is the true fulfillment of circumcision. True forgiveness, true salvation is in Jesus. The all, all of the Old Testament was simply pointing forward to it. If you were requiring and insisting on Jewish laws... In the Old Covenant, you're a law-abiding Israelite. If you're insisting on Jewish laws in the New Covenant, you're a heretic. So, as a Christian, just for the practical parts, as a Christian, what are the food laws? Well, basically, if I can say it very simply, and even at risk of being misunderstood, eat whatever you want, as long as it's not to gluttony or to harming your body. The foods themselves are not clean or unclean anymore. The, what about drinking? Well, drink whatever you want. Even mineral water. I don't, but you can if you want. Don't know why I'd waste your time. Even, even <coughs> sorry, I'll try and say, even Victorian wines. I know we're in South Australia. You wouldn't even dare. Why? But, you know, someone could. It's not, it's not technically a sin. <laughs> Uh, You can drink what you want as long as it's with thanksgiving and never to drunkenness. And with love so that you're not tempting others who may be sinning in doing so. The clothing, what are you you allowed to wear? What fabrics, what, what holidays and festivals and feasts are we allowed to partake in? The created order was made for the sons of God. Enjoy all of it as long as you're not celebrating sin. As long as you are not requiring these celebrations of other people. What about worship laws? Where are we allowed to worship? When are we allowed to worship? Well, wherever and whenever you can worship in spirit and truth, you may do so. So we've seen that Christ is the substance of the Old Testament and therefore reject the Jewish legalism, which was happening in Colossae. Then secondly, we can look in verse 18 and see... That Christ is the true source of growth, so reject the pagan asceticism. Verse 18. Let no one disqualify you. This disqualify is a technical term of somebody who would be in the Roman or Greek games, the Olympics, and they would be squatting right next to the, not right next to the jump line maybe as you're doing long jump or right in front of the discus foul line as you're doing your athletics. And, and if you overstep to the mark, they'd blow their whistle, they'd raise their flag, they'd disqualify you. And he's saying, let no one follow you around in your Christian life, not a, not a YouTube personality. 
that lives in your mind rent-free, not a friend that's more legalistic than you, not an abusive pastor from down the road or wherever you've come from. Don't let anybody disqualify, follow you around in the Christian life and disqualify you for things that are not actually sins. He says, let no one disqualify you, insisting, here's what that little judge is insisting they do in Colossae, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up with reason by his sensuous mind. One of the truisms you need to know in your Christian life is that nature abhors a vacuum. Wherever a vacuum, this happens even in the corporate world, maybe you've experienced this, or on your sports team, younger people, with something like leadership. If there's not strong leadership, somebody will fill that. You take away a captain from a team, somebody else will try and rise up. Nature abhors a vacuum. You, you take the gas out of, a, out of a, a space or a room, other gases will flow in. It's true with our theology. If you don't have a robust, dense theology of sanctification, if you don't have that, the devil, his demons and false teachers will be glad to fill that for you. But you will have a theology of sanctification. And so what we're seeing in Colossae is that they didn't have a robust view of sanctification, which is the catechism tells us, I'm sure you all know it. What is sanctification? Or what are the two parts of sanctification? Sanctification is mortification of sin and living to righteousness. That's the two parts. You kill your sin, you bring to life righteousness and obeying the law. Where you don't have that, sanctification will look like whatever the culture shoves into that hole in your theology. And that's what was happening in Colossae. They didn't have a robust Christ-centered in sanctification. And so without that, the asceticists came along, and the Jewish legalists came along, and the pagan worshippers came along, and the Christians went, well, yeah, that does look holy, I guess. Now, it does look impressive. I, I think that is what being really spiritual looks like. So there's this word here, asceticism. The asceticism came is really a word that means a punishment of the flesh and a refusal as much as possible, a refusal to enjoy the physical world. And remember, this comes back to the dualism of their theology. Spirit good, physical bad, Spirit God's good, creating the physical world God bad, which means for us, this body, before you do anything, just, just the fact of having the body, evil. The spirit inside of you, good. Look at how it affected their life. They no longer asked the question, is this act moral and God glorifying and law abiding? They didn't ask that question. They simply asked the question, is this something I engage my body in or is this something I engage my spirit in? So sanctification became for the asceticists, punish your body. It was, and this comes up in Catholic theology. This comes up in reformed circles. This comes up in, in every circle that Christianity occurs. There's always people or there's the little temptation for all of us to engage in this. It's basically a race to who can enjoy life the least. Because they're really holy. I've never seen him smile. He must love Jesus. He's, he's just all, he, he never comes to a party to celebrate the good gifts that God gives us in life. He must. That man knows the true and living God. He walks with the Spirit. She walks with the Spirit. Do you know how grumpy they always are at the state of the world? No hope, no joy down here, pining for the world to come, never able to enjoy God's good gifts. They, they are filled with the Spirit. It, it happens. And what it became in, in their world was this. If I can have a spiritually ecstatic vision or a trance or, a, or an experience that is by nature good, it doesn't matter which angel or demon excited it in me. It doesn't matter if I went to the, to the pagan temple and drank their, their pharmacinia, their, 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 their drug potion that they would drink in order to go into a trance. It doesn't matter what you did to get there. It doesn't even matter, and here's what else they would do, if you went up to the temple prostitute, had your drugs, drank your wine, engaged in sin with her, because that's not sin. That's just your body. 
It doesn't matter what happens to your body, it's evil anyway. Do whatever you want with your body and body parts. Just do it so that you can get the spiritual high. Or come into church and jump on the ground and bark and scream. Yell all sorts of nonsense. Run around. It doesn't matter how you get there. The important thing is a spiritual ecstasy. That's how it looks even today. That's how it looked in in, in Colossae. So you feed the spirit through worshipping angels and demigods. And uh, the greatest sin was, 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 was looking after your body and, and, uh, and uh, uh, even having the freedom that we've talked about to enjoy God's good gifts in the world. Look at what Paul actually calls this at the, towards the end of verse 18. These people going on in detail about their visions, right? They get up in church on Sunday in Colossae, you can imagine, in 62 AD. And he gets up and says, Church, I just want to share with you something that the angels gave me. Gabriel came down and he took me to the seventh heaven and he told me that you're all to buy me another Jaguar. And uh, anyway, that was, that, that's beside the point, but you should do it. Uh, uh, and, and what I saw was the, 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 the seventh heaven and I had these experiences and God told me revival's coming and I was yada, 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 yada going on in detail about their visions. Paul would be up the back yawning until he got up, stood next to the guy, and then put him into a spiritual coma, right? Have a vision now. <clears throat> Look at what he calls it. He calls it puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. Your version might say carnal mind. He's puffed up. That's the idea of of hot air. He's basically saying all this amazing spiritual ecstasy you're boasting about, it's all just hot air. It's, it's weightless. It has no bearing on the Christian life whatsoever. It just floats you up above the earth and leaves you dangling in the air. It has no practical benefit. It's just hot air. But he also calls them carnal-minded. Without reason in carnal mind. Now, now, without reason is a funny phrase because to us it sounds like you're not very intelligent. But, it, but in, the, in the Greek idea, it, it included that. But, but reason was also a spiritual thing. So he's saying they're puffed up with hot air without any spirituality. It, it, they're without reason. They're not thinking. Their soul is not engaged, in other words, in the Greek understanding. They're without their soul. They think they're elevating in their soul, but their soul is actually still back down on earth. It's just hot air that's floating up. You know what they are enjoying? A sensuous mind or a carnal mind or in just today's nomenclature, a meathead. A carnal, meaning meat, fleshly brain. They're just meatheads. What is amazing is how, in fact, how very spiritual carnality can look sometimes. We're all aware that carnality can look like getting drunk, sleeping around, swearing, enjoying far too much to excess the things of the earth. That's carnality, no doubt. Do you realize also that ecstasy about visions and and a severity to the body and a refusal to enjoy God's good gifts and a moping and and an ecstasy that you're chasing and a going to the mountains to experience God out there, disconnected from the real world just as carnal. It's the sensuous mind, the the flesh of sin that is in fact empowering that and not the spirituality. When you you go to to see people and they have have, uh, these amazing um, spiritual experiences, don't be tempted, Paul's saying. Don't be, as they disqualify you, because brother, have you had the vision? Sister, have you experienced the touch? Did you, did you feel the heat rush through your body? Just go, how idiotically fleshly. I live by faith, not by sight. What we need to realize is that feelings are a type of sight. A sense in the body is a way of having a concrete reality to believe instead of just knowing by faith I am joined to Jesus Christ by faith alone. Look at, look at verse 8 in chapter 2. As we re, uh, 
revise and summarize what the, the themes that he's been speaking on this whole book has been. He says in verse 8, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. So that's what we're talking about now. Don't let them take you away and trick you that that's actual spirituality. Why? Verse 9. Because in him, in Christ... The whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. The heretics cannot amen that, remember? The whole fullness of deity was divided up among millions of gods. You can't say one being has all the deity. Yes, you can. Jesus Christ. And what you definitely can't say is that the whole divinity came into a body. The body is the evil thing. No. Paul... Look, he's literally just flipping the bird to the heretics at this point. He's being as offensive to their theology as he can because they dare to mar the bride of Christ. He says the whole fullness of deity dwelt bodily in a flesh body. And then what happened? And verse 10, and you have been filled in him. The heretics had this language of fullness. Hey, brother, come and get the touching, the anointing. Come and have the experience, and then you'll have this fullness they would speak of. And Paul is saying to the weakest, newest, youngest, least knowledgeable Christian, by faith, you are put to death and raised up again in Jesus Christ. Your sins are all forgiven, and into you came the fullness of divine being by the person of the Holy Spirit who so connects you to Christ that you are filled to the brim with as much of the divine presence as God could give. You don't need to go anywhere to access an additional filling. Anything else is a lie. Yes, God fills us with his spirit by way of giving us additional strength, but really, that is just a matter of increasing our understanding of what we already have and living in it, not actually giving us more of Jesus. So asceticism and severity to the body is just meat-headedness. Look at what verse 19 says. He says, you know what that is? That's not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. He's using an analogy from the human nature. He's saying God's designed the body to work a certain way. If you try and be a doctor and, and try and help, help the, maybe somebody's got foot issues or nerve issues or gut issues, and you try and solve it in any other way without recognizing that the brain controls the nerves and the heart controls the blood, and the lungs control the oxygenation, if you ignore God's systems that he's inbuilt to this thing, you won't go anywhere. You can't try and attach the pinky to the armpit in hope of solving the liver. Okay? And that's exactly what this false sanctification is doing. He says, the way that the body works in Christianity is that Jesus is the head and heart We are all the body parts. The only way we grow is by clearing out the arteries so we have a deeper connection to Jesus Christ. Is by by clarifying and, and clearing your diet so that your gut is purer to receive from Jesus Christ more deeply. All you need to do to grow is is lean more heavily on Jesus Christ. All you need to do to grow is learn more about Jesus Christ. All you need to do to grow is come more to the preaching of Jesus Christ. That's it. Everything else, literally, he's saying, is a sanctification without its head. So these false teachers are like a doctor that you go to and they ignore the fact that your body has no head. Okay, imagine you're a first responder. Maybe some of you in the ambulance or something like that. Or, and, um, and you rock up to the scene and there's been a car crash and, and you've done a first aid online $2 course. And so you run out and go, I'll help. And you throw on your gloves and somebody says, please don't bother. His body's there and his head's here. And you go, hey, hey, it's all good. I bought my essential oils. So you go and you crack them out and you start applying them to the feet and the legs. Find the main artery points and dashing it on. You even do some ang- ar- 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 
acupuncture. That's the one I'm after. Do some an- a- acupuncture and, and try and fix things up. And, go, has, and then you start, wait, I didn't do a health survey. And go, can I just, does this person eat red meat? Uh, do you know how many seed oils they've had? Were they fully vaccinated? Uh, I just need to know. And so you start, you start assessing all of these other things and somebody's just off to the side saying, he doesn't have a head. <laughs> That's what Paul is doing. He's looking at the Colossians, lining up for the, for, the, for the spiritual doctors of the Colossian heretics, and he's going, they don't have connection to the head. They're severing your head from your body. That's not going to help. What you need is a Epaphras. You need to go back to the Sunday gathering. Go to your Saturday doctrinal classes. Go to your midweek Bible studies. Read the word. Pray. Fellowship with the people. Attend the sacraments by faith and with humility. And then and only then will your connection to the head be secure and pure. And then you'll grow. There's no growth without it. Jesus is not only sufficient enough to get you to heaven and save your sins, he is also sufficient enough, as he is your focus, to completely purify and sanctify you. And he's the only way that happens. By God's design. People often run away to a to an impressive conference or a prayer experience or a fire omega workshop or a prophecy day or an anointing night or a favor conference or an encounter experience or a vision convention or a presence summit. These are all I got all of these offline. These are real things. I can I wouldn't call them real. The, the actual events. <clears throat> they are the empower symposium. People go to the experience. Instead of going to the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ to be fed and nourished from the head down to every ligament, bone, and body part. And then look at verse 20. So we've seen, number one, Jesus is the substance of all the Jewish shadows, so reject the legalism. Jesus is the... Uh, uh, um, Jesus is the, what was the other one? Uh, The source of your true growth. So reject the false asceticism. Thirdly, we're saying Christ has made you dead to the world. So reject dead spiritual religion. Look at verse 20. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you're still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? In other words, he's saying, you remember that in the gospel, it's not just that Jesus died for you. It's that in Jesus, you died with him to the world. The world is crucified to you just as much as Jesus was crucified for you. Spirit, this, is a, this is another truism. Spiritually dead minds, whether they know it or not, serve deathly demons. Dead human spirits, all unconverted people, whether they realize it or not, dead spirits serve fallen spirits. Dead souls serve fallen angels, whether they realize it or not. Verse 15 of chapter 2 has already told us that these are the rulers and authorities of the world that Jesus disarmed in our salvation. If you're not in Jesus, they aren't disarmed for you. And they are, in fact, in some way, I'm not saying there's demons behind every rock and corner, but the system is so empowered by the devil and his angels. And we might think how how very old-fashioned that is, you know, and we think of the ancient world, how they would do ridiculous, unheard of things, like like giving themselves over to child sacrifice, having having visions and and, and, and angel worship and demon worship, uh, drug-induced ecstasy. How they would have visions on the ayahuasca drinks or the the pharmacania, which was the the drugs of the ancient world that the Jews were told to stay away from. They would have sexual immorality and musical dances with loud drums and they would do bodily torture as they cry out to their gods and these ancient, dumb, ignorant things that we're just glad in the West we've done away with those, right? Ha. If you were there yesterday, you would have heard Pastor Wayne talk about the paganism we seek not creeping, flooding back into the West, where we have child sacrifice through abortion, literal occultic practices that see abortion as a sacrament, 
as a perversion of the Lord's Supper. We have New Age veneration of what they call interdimensional angels. That as you get into a trance and a vision, I've, I have made, I have a few people at my church that have come out of this and have experienced meeting interdimensional angels. They're just called demons, all right? That they meet in their trances, that lead them onto mysterious truths. We have drug addiction and substance abuse and spiritual experiences that come out of that. We have mediums and palm reading hippies. We have sex parades, sex cults, skyrocketing pornography rates, and perverts grooming kids in public. That's not even to mention the actual systemic world religions. <laughs> Dead souls serve fallen spirits, whether they realize it or not. That's the way it has been. That's the way it always will be. In Christ, he's saying, in his death, you died to all of those elemental spirits of the world. It's as if we were, we, were, we were in a drug agency. You know, we were, we were in the mafia or we were in a, in a, in a small-time gang. And I don't know, where's the dodgy part of Adelaide? West Adelaide, I don't know. Uh, 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 and you were in a gang and you were running the drugs and you were harming people and lighting places on fire. And you were, you were off the books. You were this, you were this, this, this down and dirty criminal. And, and then you maybe had an uncle who worked in the DEA on the Drug Enforcement Agency, and, and he was able to get you a fake passport, fake name, fake birth certificate, and fake ID, save you from this gang, deport you to another city, like the heavenly Brisbane. Imagine. <laughs> Crime is at an all-time low. The beautiful Brisbane. And say, start a new life. And he faked your death <laughs> down in Adelaide. He would say, you're dead to that world. And then he visited Brisbane on a long service leave. He went to his favorite place in the world, went to Brisbane, and he found you, and he found you stapling posters all over Brisbane saying, Hitman available, drug runner wanted. And he's like, and you're back in the system. He would be heartbroken, he would grab you, he'd throw you into an alley probably, grab you by the collar and say, you were dead. As far as that world knows, you're dead. Why are you voluntarily going back and submitting yourselves to that horrible oppression? That's what Paul's saying. He's saying to his beloved congregation that Epaphras has planted, friends, why? If Jesus went to the extent of dying and bleeding and rising so that those forces might be disarmed to you and you're dead on their books, why, oh why, are you going back voluntarily and submitting to those regulations? It's folly. Realize the freedom you have and live as if you died to that world. And therefore, verse 20 to 23 is the reality that only Christ stops the indulgence of the flesh so just reject all of this false holiness. Verse 20 goes on. Why, as if you were still alive to the world, do you submit to regulations, verse 21, such as, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. It somewhat crudely says, which all refer to things that perish as they are used. In other words, you put something in your mouth, what does it turn into? It turns into the heretic's theology. That's what it turns into. By the time it passes out of you, yeah, the, that pile, that's heretic theology. <laughs> A steaming pile of Colossian heresy. That's what it comes out as. It, it perishes as you eat it or as you use it. According, these are according to human precepts and teachings. Now, these indeed have an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. He's saying again, why are you submitting yourself to their systems of regulations that, that we've just talked about? There's nothing to gain there. Do you think that heaven could give anything else and that if God did have something else additional to give, that he would give it through those unchristian avenues? Don't you realize that anything there is to gain is in Christ our head and it's only by our connection, commitment and faith in him that we gain anything that God has to offer. If you have to go anywhere else other than the scriptures to Christ... If you have to go anywhere else other than that avenue to gain that spirituality, it's a demonic spirituality. 
It's a dead religion. In fact, it's not just neutral, it's spiritually toxic. They boast, and it says here, they boast about an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body. But the reality here is they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. That's the ultimate failure of man-made religion in the church and out of the church. It just can't do what it's telling you it can help you do. It's the, it's the pyramid scheme that keeps on telling you if you just invest a bit more, if you just do a bit more, if you just keep on chasing after the experience and the severity, and if you, 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 you brutalize your body more, then you'll have the fullness. But it's a treadmill that simply starves its congregants. It has no power that it claims to have. Even godliness is defined by Christ-likeness, not just salvation. <clears throat> There is no power in them. We even read as uh, just earlier in uh, 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 2 Timothy 3 about having the, these people, these false teachers who have the appearance, appearance of godliness, but denying its actual power. Do you know what its actual power is? Putting sin to death and living to godliness. They don't actually do that. They look spiritual. They look impressive on the inside. They're dead tombs filled with, old, with dead men's bones. It says that they go into the houses of, of women who are burdened by sin and, and, and uh, who, who are unable to arrive at the uh, a knowledge of the truth. They go in there, they prey on people because again, where there's a vacuum, the false teachers will leap in and say, oh, you're suffering? You're struggling? Your pastor probably just keeps on telling you to read your Bible, pray. He prays with you, he reads the Bible with you, he teaches you about Christ. Isn't that boring? Isn't that simple? Don't you just want something tangible you can hold and you can see? Well, I have a system that, and sometimes God appears in the space. Uh, people have these visions. You ever had a vision? And so they try and sell something. And we need the immune system as a church. We need, you need, the, 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 the reality and, and the, the, the wherewithal to be able to say, even to yourself, in the deepest parts of your struggle as a Christian, when your soul is clinging to the dust, you need to be able to tell yourself, do not listen to the temptation. Do not take the bait of... It's like a man starving at sea in a little life raft. And he knows, he has absolute certainty that the the, the helicopter that took his wife is coming back for him. He knows that. He needs to wait for the promised means of salvation. But in the meantime, he's thirsty. And he's parched and he's sweaty and he's burning. And the temptation that life rescuers always say, he wants to drink the salt water. But if he does, he will die rapidly. And that's us. That's the Christian and the struggle of your life. You, you feel tempted at any point to turn to something else, but you need the wherewithal to say, it is enough that Jesus Christ died for me. It is enough that in him I have fullness. No matter what else I miss out on on this life, I need to on sometimes remember our freedom and at other times remember to not walk in a so-called freedom that is in fact sin. Do you think, I, I wonder how you, how you think of your Christianity and your walk in Christ. Would one word that you use to describe that relationship with God's creation and your Savior, would one word you use to describe that be freedom? Very few Christians would be willing to say that or live a reality where they say, yeah, a peaceful, almost relaxed freedom. Yes, I'm fighting sin. I, I'm reading my Bible and stringent in my disciplines, and yet that is the sense of freedom. Would you think that way? Or, or are you a little bit more like Eve? Are you a little bit too much listening to the temptation of Satan, the first legalist, who said, you know, God's put you, God's put you here, and man, he has a lot of rules. Man, he has really emphasized what you're not allowed to do. He's really emphasized what, what you're not allowed to enjoy. He doesn't sound like he, he wants the best for you, this God. You know what he said? He said, you're not allowed to eat of the best garden around here. You know what Adam and Eve should have said? Yeah, but he commanded that we enjoy every other thing. Some of us think that we're more spiritual than God because we have this stringent view of the Christian life that is joyless and strict and formulated by all kinds of laws. 
There are rules, there are laws, there are commandments, and yet they are, just like in the Garden of Eden, a freedom. Those, those rules are the fences on the side of the cliff. They're not chains that keep you down and ruin your life. And here's the, the, the powerlessness that we're reading here in this legalism. It's not only does it make, it doesn't believe the right freedom that God gives us, but it also simply has no power. You could tick every box in a legalist's checklist and not be saved. Some of you have lived that way. Some of you have been to church every Sunday and done the giving and done the praying and rocked up to the additional services and, and tried to pursue every other avenue of righteousness, and yet you're not saved. Because you have done those things while neglecting the head that is Jesus Christ who lived for you and died for you to earn a righteousness you could never earn. To die the death that you deserved but could never fully pay. You deserved an eternal dying punishment in hell that would never end. But Jesus died to pay your penalty. And he rose again to give to you now the Holy Spirit and new life. To give to you now forgiveness and a peace of conscience. And to give you in the world to come eternal bliss and joy. Some of you have tried to chase the law to get to God instead of coming to Jesus Christ to get to God. And you need to repent of your sin of legalism and religion and come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of you are truly saved, and yet, and yet you allow the, the, the cleanliness, the well-sanded edges of legalism to abound in your family or in your circles. You don't so much mind whether they're truly saved. Are my children well-behaved? I don't talk to them about the grace of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, but what I need them to do is obey me, is look good, to look like a Christian family. Or maybe in your own spirituality, you allow the same kinds of things. It is so tempting. That's why it came up in Colossae. It's why it, why it comes up in every generation, in every denomination of the church. And yet the constant call of Paul is to repent of our legalism, repent of our religion, and look straight to Jesus Christ through the gospel and by faith and faith alone cry that we have nothing in our hands to bring. Simply to the cross I cling. There we receive salvation and from there flows our true, powerful sanctification. That's the gospel. Let's pray. Father God, you are so good and so gracious to us, your children. We thank you for this unique, amazing invention of yours called the church. A people that are individually saved by faith in Christ and yet plugged together and bound together by the fellowship of the Holy Spirit and then formulated in different local churches and congregations. And, and it's through this means that you change the world. It's through this, this institution, the local church, that you save souls, that you gather in all of your lost children, and you achieve your promises of old. We thank you, God, for all of these things. We thank you that as individuals dressed and marred and, and, and defiled by our sin, we can throw ourselves into the fountain of Christ's blood and be completely cleansed. And we can, we can be entirely purified of our, of, our, of our disease of sin and you charge us as righteous and you credit us as forgiven and you allow us into your family and right now you love us with an eternal love. Because you've made us one with Christ, we can confidently say that we have from you the same infinite love that you love your son. For we are in him. We have been filled in him who himself is filled with the entire divinity. Father God, I think over, over this congregation that I do not know personally, but I'm blessed to be here among. And we thank you for the work of Pastor Wayne and the others who help and serve. And Father God, we pray that today souls would maybe for the first time, yes, if there's any in our midst who do not know Jesus Christ personally, truly, and really, that you would give to them today a new heart to reach out and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. We pray, Lord God, that, that this church would live under the blessing of the Colossians 
Christian uh, promise that Christ is sufficient, that they don't need to add something to get holy, that they don't need to avoid the world and the physical blessings in order to be spiritual. But Father God, you have infused this, this physical world with so many spiritual blessings and it is ours to enjoy. Father God, allow us to enjoy responsibly. Allow us to enjoy in love and care towards our brothers and sisters. Please, this morning, free people from the the mindset bonds to legalism and asceticism that they might be able to give you glory for the good gifts you give to your children. Lord God, we thank you for Jesus Christ and pray again that he would be magnified, that he would be glorified this day and every day in the life of this church, that you would bring new people into this building, that they would be saved, that they would be discipled, that this church would grow with a growth that is from God. Father God, thank you for the preaching of the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ that saves unworthy sinners. It's in his name that we pray and everybody said, Amen. Amen.